Before we get started, thank you to Castellia Cocktails for their support of Daily Detroit. Don't just drink cocktails, experience them. With matching scents and knowledgeable bar keeps to guide you, it is a great experience. Try one of their pairings or feel free to go off the menu with an adventure for your senses. The menu both tells you how boozy a drink is and there is a full non-alcoholic lineup taking care to give you a top-notch sensory experience no matter how you'd like to drink. Whether it's the intimate indoor bar with less than 20 seats or when spring really decides to happen, hanging out on the patio outside enjoying the best Detroit has to offer, Castalia is a great spot for a night out, a drink after dinner, or a date. And you'll find it at 3980 2nd Avenue in Detroit. Their new menu is called Riddles with eight different thought-provoking riddles that will keep your brain occupied while you imbibe. Castalia is open to all Wednesdays through Saturdays from 5 to 11 p.m., with unique experiences for small groups anytime with a reservation. You can learn more at CastaliaCocktails.com. That's CastaliaCocktails.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Daily Detroit. It is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. Now, I know longtime fans of the show will be sad that Devin O'Reilly is not here on a Friday, uh, despite uh, the desires of his haters, because last week, oh my gosh, he got all the haters out, uh, or people who would literally, want someone said, who was like, get him off the show. We're not getting him off the show. I haven't put him in a trunk. I haven't dropped him in the Detroit River or any other waterway, for that matter. Let's be clear. There are no cement shoes. Devin O'Reilly is coming back. This week, we have none other than Fletcher Sharp, because Fletcher Sharp, Oh my gosh, Oakland Grizzlies for the win. Yeah, I did say earlier this week that uh, I thought Oakland would struggle and did not think they would get past Kentucky. I knew they needed to shoot the ball well to get past a team that had more length than them. I did not realize that Jack Golke would turn into literally Johnny Flame and uh, throw up some high school looking three point shots. He looked super comfortable. He looked like those clips you see of those players when they're playing, you know, youth league ball and they're just shooting up any shot because they just know they can get any shot. The last three pointer he hit as he caught it, even though it was, a, it was an awkward shot, I'm like, that's going in. Like, there's no there's no way that shot does not go in. And, yeah, he became the fifth player to hit 10 three pointers in an NCAA game, which is wild. And when you have people like that in your roster who can hit shots at that rate, it really changes the game. There's a stat I didn't realize about him. He's attempted 240-odd shots this season. Only eight of them have been from the two-point range. He's kind of like Travis Bader, former Oakland Golden Grizzly, who is a proficient three-point shooter, where like he's only on the court to do one thing. It's to get space and shoot threes. Look, I got to say this. Although more than 99% of people's brackets are already busted, I have word from listeners that after... The show on Monday, they changed their brackets and added OU, and they are very thankful. Yeah. I mean, even if you had Oakland winning, I'm sure your bracket's probably a little bit busted. But, yeah, it's really great for the program. It's their first win in the tournament proper because the last time that they won was in 2005 with Royal Marshall in them. But that was in the pre-tournament. That was not like... Was that like the play-in? Now they're, the, they're called the first four games, but it was back then when they didn't really have an official name for it. So while it was their first win in the tournament, it was not, you know, the tournament proper. This is their first win in the tournament proper. That's a very big deal. And to beat a team like Kentucky with a legendary coach, John Calipari, that's huge. If you can beat a team like that, you can make a run. Uh, It'll be a little bit rougher going forward just because people now know that while Jack did not have tremendous stats this season, he is prone to going off, as is all their shooters. Could be a little bit tougher going forward, but like if you can have a performance like this, maybe can carry you forward. And I like the confidence at the end of the interview uh, they had on TV where he said, We're not a Cinderella. That means like we're here to win games. We expect to be here to win more than just one game. The confidence is is a good thing. Yeah, I want to add some context to this because listener David posted on threads to us. I want to quote this because I want your thoughts on it. Because in my mind, I've always kind of wondered why is it that OU you know, where they are, everything else. Like at first, you're not like, oh, is this going to be a powerhouse program? But listener David wrote, this absolutely was the dream 30 years ago when Coach Camp and President Rusi told OU Student Congress the university was planning on going D1. Glad to see it finally come to fruition. 
So this is huge. Not to say they wanted this because every team in the tournament wanted this, but like Oakland really wanted this. And you could tell from the tip off that it wasn't just like a, we're going to come out here. We're happy to be here. And no one expected them to just be happy to be here. Greg Camp runs a great program. They typically get close to the tournament. Maybe they don't get in all the time. They do well in the Horizon League, do well in the Horizon League tournament. But it became apparent that they came out here and this was not a team that was just trying to put on a good show like one of those programs where it's like you never really hear about like IUPUI. You hear about them occasionally and then like, you know, they're gone and then you hear about them occasionally and then they're gone. Or other programs like Long Beach State this year who fired their coach a week before their tournament and their coach has been coaching for free because he's like, why not? This isn't one of those moments. This is a program that like we're here to do some damage and congrats to them because this is a big monumental thing to have regardless of what happens going forward. Like this is something that cannot be taken away at all. Before we move on to state, their next game is on Saturday, 7, 10 PM. It turns out Saturday is going to be a huge day for sports in Metro Detroit and some great games to watch. NC state is the opponent tomorrow night, Saturday night. What are your thoughts? No, ranked 11. NC state is a quality program. They won the ACC final over rival North Carolina, which shows that they are also a quality team. They won their conference as well. They have some tremendous players. One of their players, unfortunately, was known for not a good thing. You've probably seen a meme, seen a meme on uh, Twitter of a player getting ready to shoot a free throw, and then when the ref turns his back, he gives the ref the finger. That's DJ Horn, uh, their leading scorer, who can put the ball in the bucket, but also you know is known for that. Quality. They have four players in double figures and they spread the ball around. So obviously look out for Horn. You want to look out for O'Connell as well. If you play the same intensity you played with last game, Trey Townsend gets in there, gets 12 rebounds. Anything can happen. I mean, at this point, both teams who advanced were not who were expected. So at this point, both teams are playing with house money. It should be an exciting game for sure. For sure. For sure. All right. Michigan State beat Mississippi State 69 to 51. It was not close. Good to see the win for the Spartans. What are our thoughts on this one? Tom Izzo has to probably like be real annoyed with his team. Almost every year they do this where like if they're having a down season or people are like, this team's not going to do whatever. They somehow get to March and then all of a sudden put together their first real competent game in some time. And you're like, why couldn't you do that seven games ago? Like, why did it have to be this game right now where you're on the entire net country is watching whether they're throwing in parlays, whether they're watching for Mississippi State, whether they're watching because they're for Michigan State, whether they're watching because they're for the conference. Like now people are really watching and you're like, all right, let's play for real. Come on, man. Like that's got to be frustrating as a fan. But they looked they looked like the team everyone thought they were going to be coming into the year and not the team that they were ending the season, which has to be a relief to fans. Unfortunately for them, uh, they're going to need to play that way because they are playing North Carolina, who we mentioned was just in the ACC final. They lost North Carolina State, which is kind of funny. Both Michigan teams are playing two teams from North Carolina. Can't really write that in the script. But yeah, they're going to need to play well because North Carolina is very good. They have some great players as well. Uh, they have Armando Baycott, who just is a demon on the boards. I don't really understand how he just grabs as many rebounds as he does, but he's a high clip rebounder. They have R.J. Davis who can put the ball in the basket as well. And just, yeah, maybe they're not the North Carolina of old with, you know, Michael Jordan, Tyler Hansbro, Sean May, but, like, they are in North Carolina. They have some really great players, and if you have one of those games where you switch off and don't pay attention, they will run up the score on you. Tom Izzo is probably getting his team ready, you know, football tactics, make sure they stay in there. They can do the same thing. You know, they can even make a run as well. Yeah, if they can beat UNC, they're for real. Yeah, that's just a tall task. To, yeah, oh, for sure. It, 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 I'm not saying it's not. But, like, if they can hold UNC, if they can control the, the boards, which is hard to do, again, against someone like Baycott getting rebounds, anything's possible. So this next segment, I do have to put a little bit of a warning in front of uh, because we are talking about topics around uh, a bit of uh, domestic violence, or at least it's going to be mentioned. So just so you know on this one. So Fletcher Sharp, it seems like there was an entire story arc with in like the last few days, usually this isn't the case, but since we talked on Monday, it feels like we went from the Lions are in a great position for the draft to what's happening with Cam Sutton to 
oh my gosh, he's got a warrant for what he did for apparently there's a strangulation marks on an alleged victim to being on the run, still not found as of this recording, to being cut from the lions. Like an entire arc has happened in just a few days. Yeah, this is a sad story, not just for, you know, the victim, but to a very small, small degree, Cam Sutton, because something had to have happened to make this situation unfold the way that it did. And it's very unfortunate for the everyone involved. This is just not great. And the fact he's on the run means like something is very, very wrong. And hopefully this can get resolved in a peaceful way where no one else gets hurt. But removing that and going solely towards the sports side, uh, it leaves the Lions with a bit of a conundrum. Now, one of their starting corners is gone. They have to look to replace him because, again, at the end of the day, the NFL is a business. And while this situation is tremendously unfortunate and just not a great look all around, they can't roll into the season and say, we had this happen. Can we have a, a voucher? No, you have to go sign someone. I'm not sure who's available. I know people are still looking at Legereus Sneed, who I just don't think will come to Detroit from the Chiefs. It would be great to have a player like that, but I just I don't see it being a thing. So they need to find a cornerback who can help maybe take uh, some short contracts or if go all in on the draft and signing cornerbacks and making sure you get someone who you think can replace production. Look, I'll be honest with you. I don't think you want to put somebody fresh out of the draft straight into the starting lineup and doing your main thing. Like To me, I feel like this is a two-step move. I think you need to sign a veteran. You need to spend the money. A bunch of that money is going to come back to you. Uh, the way that they're structuring it, and apparently under the NFL contracts, if there's certain things that a player does, you just can get cut and it doesn't hurt your cap. So that process, including the legal process, has to all play out. So it's not like they're going to be left with like holding the bag for Cam. So there will be resources. And I feel like what you do is you go out there and you get somebody big for one year, and then you backfill it with the draft and try to build that up. My first thought, especially because there's already connections to the team with his brother, is Stephon Gilmore, because his brother Steven's already on the squad. You know, I get it, he's older, but he brings some experience that's needed, and he's there for a purpose. And you know what? We make a Super Bowl run. Yeah, I don't know. He is a former All-Pro player, big corner, banging corner, great for bump and run coverage. Uh, which the Lions like to do occasionally. But he's coming off three straight one-year deals, uh, one with the Colts, one with the Panthers, who are both abysmal, one with the Cowboys last year where he had some decent numbers. But he's going to be around 34 years during part of the season. And, like, I don't know. Those are the scary years for a cornerback. Like, unless you're Deion Sanders or someone, I don't really want to take a risk on a cornerback that old. And I feel so weird saying that because that's like around my age and like I feel just fine. But also I know that I couldn't go out there and cover like I'm on Ross St. Brown like right now. I couldn't do that anyways if I was healthy, but like I definitely couldn't do it at this age. It gives me pause, but Gilmore could be an exception to the rule potentially. There are some people they could be looking at. Marcus Lattimore, Xavier Howard, both would require some trades. Again, people really want Legereus need who won a Super Bowl with the Chiefs. Well, obviously. I mean, I want him too. I just don't think we can get him. It'd be hard to get him because they'd have to trade a high pick and they already gave away a third for Carlton Davis. So unless they're really certain that they want this guy and they don't care about dra the draft, which would be kind of against what Brad Holmes has typically done, I'm not really sure. We do not usually get a chance to talk about this on a Friday, Fletcher, but as we've got the DCFC match on Saturday afternoon against Loudon, let's get into it. First, though, let's talk about this loan pickup. It's exciting. Chicago Fire Organization coming to Detroit. Yeah, Victor Bezerra, 6'2", forward, uh, who can play a little bit on the wing. Exciting prospect. Scored eight goals for Chicago Fire 2 last year. 28 for Indiana University, which is a quality soccer program in the country. For me, the more excitement is less about the player coming on to help, who will probably add some bench depth for sure. But it's the fact that Detroit City is getting loans from a team above them. That shows that maybe their finances are not all the way fixed, but they're in a better state to where they can get a player in that they're going to play for part of their contract, probably pay more if he plays or if he does not. There's probably stipulations that we're not going to find out about because loan contracts are very tricky. 
But like, it's good that some program says, here, take one of our young players and help develop them. We trust you. That's essentially what loans are, is someone's coming in. We trust you to get this guy some game time and help him understand like what it's like to be a professional player. So yeah, he brings eight goals in the Chicago Fire 2 and was a direct impact to all of their wins that they had last year. So it's very helpful to have. Probably going to be attacking a bit off the wing, probably on the right side. Maybe offering some help up top if Elvis Amo needs a break. Uh, if Yazid's unavailable to go, uh, you have a younger player there who can do something. But he's able to help in all of the attacking points up front. It's huge. It's huge. How are you feeling about the Loudon match? Yeah, so Loudon had a pretty good, they started off pretty well. A win, in a win in a draw, and the draw came against San Antonio after going down a man. So that shows like they are legit this year. They have a forward in Zach Ryan who was pretty great last year, picked up a red card against Detroit, but still pretty great for the year. You got to keep track of him. They have Khalil Al Medkar, who is on the wing. Either side can play great quick feet. Got to keep track of him. But if their offense is as dynamic as it looked from week one, none of that should be an issue because they can unlock many people. I see them winning 2 to 1. It's going to be not the best weather. Yeah, are you bringing your coat cuz I'm going to I'm like I'm going to look like an Eskimo out there. Yeah, I'm going to bring a coat and gloves and maybe even a gator just to be safe cuz I'm not trying to see people with a snotty nose. <laughs> well, that match is at 4 p.m. at Keyworth if you'd like to join us. Also, all over television and seems to be really great response from fans for the CBS Detroit product. Yeah, for sure. Any way that they can get them on television and like get them somewhere where people can see them is great. But the fact that the product seems to not maybe not leave people with nostalgia, but make people feel like this is a good product that we have going. That can only mean good things going forward for the season. For sure. As always, if you've got thoughts, 313-789-3211 to the rant line. Or daily Detroit at gmail.com. That is it for today and the week. Thank you so much, Fletcher Sharp, for pinch hitting for Devin O'Reilly on this Friday. Always good to talk to you. Of course. Like I said, I'm glad to be here. And, you know, any day that people want to hear the words out of my mouth, I'll happily offer them up. With that, I am Jer Stays. And I'm Fletcher Sharp. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our members on Patreon who keep this thing going. And of course, thank you to those behind the scenes who keep this thing going as well. Remember that you are somebody. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next week.